Okay, tonight is Galatians chapter 5. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. In the first verse, the, uh, the, the message to me is fairly straightforward. What Paul is saying is, don't look back. Okay, you've come this far. This is not the time to look back to where you were, thinking that maybe it was better back where I was, to continue moving forward. Right? As he says, as the liberty with Christ has made us free, be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Right? You were previously in bondage. You're now free. You don't want to go back and be in bondage all over again. Okay, now in the second and third verses, he's using uh, you know, one of his popular examples here of circumcision, which we've uh, heard many times in, throughout the Galatians epistle here. And um, again, it's important to understand that uh, he's not necessarily speaking against circumcision as a, a practice or as a thing to do, right? But more saying it doesn't really matter in terms of salvation, right? As you say, it says, if, you know, in two you could think otherwise, as if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing, right? But what he's really saying is that if you depend upon circumcision and things like that for salvation, then Christ profits you nothing, right? In other words, there's things you can do yourself that you think is going to bring you salvation, that means you're not depending upon Christ, so Christ profits you nothing. You basically want to handle it yourself. And of course, we know that that's not a, a way to go anyway, because we need the, the Lord for salvation. And in the, in the third verse, all right, to, you know, kind of make the same point. It says, to every man is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. In other words, even taking one, one thing, and, you know, maybe, maybe some were wanting to, compromise or do it halfway and say, uh, all right, well, I'm not going to depend on the whole law, but circumcision, that's like a, you know, that, that, that's a must, all right? You got to be circumcised. Maybe you don't do the other things, but that's, uh, that's one thing you have to do. He's saying you can't even look at it that way, right? If you're going to pick even one thing and say you have to do this one thing for salvation, well, then now you're, it says, indebted to the whole law. You may as well just go all out and say, I'm going to do it myself, right? But of course, we know that's not the way we want to depend upon Christ for our salvation. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. These verses continue with the same basic message. As you see in uh, 4, it says, you know, if, you can, if you're depending on the law yourself, Christ has become of no effect unto you. In fact, he uses the term, you're fallen from grace, right? You know, think about that, that where we are, we're in a position of grace, where we're depending upon the grace of God to save us. So if we want to depart from that, so you're fallen from grace. You were in a nice place where the Lord was giving his grace to you, and now instead you're saying, well, I don't want your grace, right? I just want to do it myself. Right? Well, now it says you become fallen from, from grace, right? And uh, five, uh, you know, Pointing out, it says, for we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith, right? That we are, our righteousness is a result of having faith in God. It's a result of the Spirit of God within us. It's a result of the Holy Ghost directing us. Okay, that uh, really no one can be totally righteous of their own. You need the Spirit of God to direct you, to help you to make the right decisions, to do the right things. Right? So I think we can all agree that if, if we're righteous, it's because of the Holy Spirit within us. That's why it says, we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Right? In, in 6, it's making the, the point that we made in the, in the first three verses. Again, getting back to the circumcision example. Right? It's pointing out that it does, circumcision of itself is not bad. All right? It says, neither circumcision availed anything nor uncircumcision. So, it, you know, you can't look at it either way. You, you know, you can't say, all right, if you're circumcised, that, that means you're in a better position. Or, you can't even say, if you're uncircumcised, you're in a better position. It makes no difference, right? It's just something that you either choose to do or not do. And we're not going to tie it to your salvation. He says, but rather faith, which working by love, is, is the way to salvation. Right? So again, important point, right? It's not, you know, you could come away from these saying, oh, to be circumcised is bad, right? To be uncircumcised is good. 
right? He's not saying that either, right? It just makes no difference. It's just something you choose to do or not do, but ultimately it depends upon the Lord for your salvation. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Seven and eight, uh, he's kind of again reflecting upon, you know, what happened here, right? So seven says, you, you did run well. In other words, you were doing good. It says, who did hinder you, all right? Who took you off the path, all right? And in eight, says, this persuasion comes not of him that calleth you, all right? So if you understand that you were called by Christ to be part of his kingdom, to be part of the family of God, right? It's not Christ who's now taking you off the path, right? But rather those who he refers to as the false apostles that came in and, and sowed these seeds of, uh, of confusion, right? That they would look more to their own strength than to look to the Lord, Right, and in, in nine, now he's saying a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Now, leaven, right, is, is an ingredient that was put in, uh, in in bread to make it rise. Right, and uh, some compare it to yeast. And so, you, again, you might say, well, what's what's the purpose of that? Why is it even pointing that out here? Right, well, it's typically likened to some type of a sinful situation. So, the lump, if you will, would be the church, right, or the people of God. And it says you, you throw a little leaven in that, right, and it's going to permeate throughout the whole group, right? That's, that's an important point, right? That's why, you know, in the church even today, we, we, you know, we try not to stand for, for sinful things because a little bit of sin that's, uh, that's seemingly allowed or you look the other way or you say, well, well that, that's okay for now, right? Well, everybody sees that and it starts to affect other people, right? And it makes its way through everybody to one extent or another. That's why it says a, a little... Leaven, leaven is the whole lump. So it's not a matter of saying, well, all right, well, it's, it's just that one, or it's just right here. No, somehow it starts to spread throughout. And so that's why it's just not a good, a good condition. And the uh, example he's using it for here is that, so if these uh, people came in and were spreading these, these little things about, you know, don't, don't depend totally on Christ, you know, look, uh, take care of yourself, do the right thing as far as the law goes, get circumcised, etc. right? Well, that starts to now permeate out to where, the whole group is affected, and that's really what Paul has found with the Galatians, is that there's, everybody is now turned around from what they were originally taught. That's why he's saying a little leaven, leaven the whole lump, a, a little bit of sin, a little bit of misadvice, a little bit of confusion makes its way and affects everybody. I have confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be none otherwise minded, but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. I would they were even cut off, which trouble you. In these verses, Paul is making reference to, again, those who came in teaching this kind of, uh, of doctrine, right, that was contrary to the gospel of Christ that Paul had taught them. Right? And uh, that's why I tell you, so I, I have confidence, all right, that uh, he that troubled you shall bear his judgment, Whoever he be, or whosoever he be, right? That um, he's saying that uh, God will, will take care of this, right? That, that if it's the incorrect teaching and uh, they're teaching you ways that, or have taught you ways that are taking you off the path, God will deal with them at some future time because God's not pleased when uh, people are teaching other people the, the incorrect way to, to serve him. And in fact, it, uh, it reminds me of uh, a scripture that, that we had studied another time in the book of James, chapter 3, verse 1, where it says, My brethren, be not many masters or teachers, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Right? He was speaking to those who wanted to be teachers over the, the people of God and said, Be careful about that, because you are opening yourself up to a greater condemnation in terms of if you teach them wrong, right? God's not going to be pleased. Well, that's what was happening here, with Paul referring to these other ones who had done this teaching, that... Uh, you know, that God will, will deal with them. Right? And, and the, the part at the end of the 10th verse where it says, whosoever he be, right? when I read that, I think of, um, you know, it's time, plenty of times today when, you know, things are said by people who were uh, famous or popular or seen as wise or smart or intelligent. And so somehow what they say means more because of who they are. And quite frankly, that's just not a valid way to look at it. Right, that uh, because you know you could get anybody who's like I said popular or famous, whatever, to say something, and then people are going to believe it. 
and it, it may be total, total nonsense, right? And in fact, it, it reminds me of a, a scene in a movie that I watched once called uh, God's Not Dead, right? Where the, uh, it was about a, a professor who was an atheist and there was a student in the class who was a, a Christian. And so the student was given the chance to try to make a pitch to the class as to, you know, that God existed. And the, uh, the, the teacher had pointed out how, like, a famous scientist said this or that about, about God, that it was not, that God was not necessary or whatever. And uh, the, the, the student uh, put a quote on the board, which, again, I've always remembered this, and I have it written down here. It says, nonsense remains nonsense, even when spoken by famous scientists. Okay, and that was a quote that somebody or other had, had said that, uh, and you think about it, it's true, right? Just because somebody famous says it, or somebody intelligent says it, doesn't make it any more true if it's false, all right? It, it says nonsense remains nonsense, no matter who's saying it. And, and that's what Paul's saying here, right? That whoever it is that, that puts this out to you, again, maybe they made a good argument, maybe they sounded intelligent, maybe they sounded like they knew what they were talking about, but whoever it was, Nonsense remains nonsense, no matter who said it, and God will, will deal with them accordingly. Now, in 11, uh, Paul is uh, referencing what may have been said about him at the time. He says, if, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Right Now, to me, if I were reading that, I would be a little confused. So, wait, wait a minute. When did Paul preach circumcision? Right? In fact, if anything, everything he says is against that. Right? But what it's referring to, as far as, as we can tell, is uh, one episode in Acts chapter 16, it says where Paul uh, wanted Timothy to accompany him on, on a missionary trip. And, uh, and, and Timothy was half Jew, half Gentile. He had not been circumcised. Where they were going was going to be among Jewish people. So Paul was thinking that Timothy would be, uh, have more credibility as one of them if he was circumcised. So he went ahead and arranged for Timothy to, to be circumcised. So, you know, it's funny how that kind of uh, episode gets around. See, you, you make maybe what seems like an exception one time, and now people start saying, oh, yeah, right, you know, you, yeah, you, you speak against circumcision, yet you, you went and had Timothy circumcised, so what, what's up with that, All right? So in that particular instance, so Paul had a reason why that made sense. It was more that Timothy would be, let's say, more credible with the audience that they were going to uh, address for, for Christ. And it reminds me of another scripture that... Uh, that Paul had written, right, where he referred to himself as being willing to be all things to all people that I might save some, right? And, and I, you know, I've often remembered that, right? That, you know, in certain things where it's not, you know, tied to, to the gospel or the doctrine or so forth, we can have some flexibility to help us reach other people, right? For example, I mean, let, let's say if here in, in the church building, right, let's say we were going to have a special day for homeless people to come here, right? And we're going to share the love of Christ with them, let's just say, okay? Now, would it make sense on that particular day for me to come in dressed in, in my best suit and tie and expensive shoes and, and so forth, right? It would be so out of place where the, these people coming in would say, well, I, I, I'm never going to be like that, all right? So clearly there's a, an immediate barrier, right? So I personally would not do that, all right? I would come in, you know, dressed down, dressed to... Roughly, I mean, maybe not you know quite the same as everybody, but at least dressed down to where I'm more in the in line with being able to in, to relate to them, all right, to interact with them. Say you know, again, I'm a little more like you. I'd say you know, we're all in this together, as opposed to you know, be a tough sell. And say yeah, we're all in this together while I'm wearing an expensive suit and, and they're wearing rags that they you know found on the side of the road, right? It's it's not really uh, it's not really a good connection that way, right? So that's an example, all right. So it's a Paul said he was willing to be all things to all people, to be whatever he had to be at a certain time to present the gospel to them that he might save some. So that's, that was his general way of, of looking at it, right? That he was willing to, to be flexible. So that's what this business about him preaching circumcision was about. It's not that he preached it, it's that but at one time he recommended it because it was going to work better to save others for the cause of Christ, right? So then in, uh, in, in 12, he concludes this part by, again, referring to those who sowed these seeds of discontent, right? He says, I would, they were even cut off, which trouble you, right? Just, you know, I, I wish they would go away. That's <laughs> really what he's saying, is that, uh, you know, God will deal with them. You know, they guess they've confused you. Don't, don't be confused, and I wish they would just, just go away and not bother you anymore. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, 
thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. Now here Paul is uh, addressing the, uh, the liberty that's uh, offered to people in, in serving Christ, right? That, uh, you know, too many times you, people take the idea that, well, liberty means I can do whatever I want, right? And that's what makes people, you know, kind of pause on that, right? To say, well, is that really what we're teaching? You do whatever you want, right? Because that's what liberty or freedom would certainly sound like, right? Well, of course, of course, we've taught that's not the case. Liberty means you're free to follow the Spirit of God, which will lead you into proper activities, proper way of thinking, and so forth, right? But here he's saying, if you've been called to liberty, don't use it for an occasion of the flesh. In other words, don't use it just for yourself, but rather seek to, to help others, to serve others. And it says, but by love, serve one another, right? And that by doing that, you're even fulfilling one of the, the commandments of Christ. As it says in 14, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Okay, this was you know, one of the two great commandments that Christ gave. So he's saying, yeah, you have liberty, so feel free to help other people. Feel free to do things for people, right? Don't feel you have to you know, be following the law to help somebody. You're doing it because of the love of Christ that's within you. So that, that's what you should feel free to do. Feel free to go help other people and serve other people, truly loving your neighbor as yourself. And in uh, 15, um, it kind of you know, refers to if you were to take it in a different direction, Right? It says, if you bite and devour one another, <laughs> look out that you're, that you're not consumed one of another. Right? So if that's the way you want to live your life, right, is by hurting others and uh, trying to climb over people and, and so forth, you know, for, for gain or for advancement, well, if that's the way you want to live, that's, that's up to you. But you should probably expect that others will do the same to you. Right? So if that's the kind of world you want to live in, the kind of life you want to, you want to lead, all right, I mean, I guess it's your choice, you know, you have freedom, but expect that then others will do the same to you. So, in other words, that's not what he's recommending, but rather that you would show love to everybody, and if you're showing love to everybody, then you would rightly expect that hopefully people would show love back to you as well. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. These verses are reinforcing what we've been saying all along in, in Galatians, right? That if you're following the Spirit, it says you don't need to worry about the law because you're going to do the right things, right? And uh, so in 16 it's saying, walk in the Spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh, okay? Because the Spirit's going to take you in the right direction, not to the lusting direction, Right, and the 17 is pointing out how the flesh and the spirit are typically at war with each other. So the things that we would want to do as humans, right, may well be contrary to the way the spirit would lead. So that, that's where we're saying, well, I want to follow the spirit. So I want the spirit to lead me in the right direction. Then you win the war, or the spirit wins the war, and the spirit of God wins the war, that you would be more the person God would want you to be, instead of what your flesh would be kind of pushing you to, to do or to be. That's why then it says in verse 18, it says, if, if you're led of the Spirit, you're not under the law, right? Of course, again, as we've said so many times already, right? And when you say you're not under the law, I mean, yes, you're still expected to do things right, but you don't have to worry about it because the Spirit will lead you to do the right things. The Spirit will lead you to not break the rules, to not do things that are contrary to the will of God. So, as always, it's about following the Spirit of God. That's why he gives it to us when we're baptized. We get the Holy Spirit within us. It leads us in the direction that we need to go, and then we're doing what's right as servants of God. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now this section lists a lot of things that are things that we should not be doing, right? And whereas, you know, some might consider this almost like a, like a checklist or a, a don't do this, don't do that kind of thing, or like law, quite frankly, right? That's not what it's intended to be, right? It, a little later in this chapter, we're going to read about uh, things called the fruits of the Spirit, right? The things in this section 
would be what I would call the fruits of the non-spirit, right? That if we're not following the spirit of God, then we're more likely to be involved in these types of activities. So these are fruits of not following the spirit, which is offered up to us as a way of checking that we're in fact following the spirit, right? And that we would not be fooled into thinking, oh, okay, yeah, I'm doing all these things, I'm following the spirit of God, you know, I'm just observing my freedom, following the spirit of God, and yeah, all right, I fall into some of these things, but no. If you're following the spirit of God, the spirit of God will not lead you into these activities, right, or into these attitudes or, or whatever, okay? So that's what is provided for, that we would be able to check ourselves and say, if, if I find myself wanting to do these or getting involved in these kind of things, that's not the spirit of God leading me. Okay, now, for the sake of, you know, the, the lesson here, I went through and uh, you know, a short definition of each of these. There's like 17 of them all together. In some cases, we may not even necessarily know what each word means. So uh, I think it would be good that we would at least have a, a brief, basic understanding of what the words mean. So this way we can be looking for these kind of things in our life and say, oh, well, I'm not following the Spirit here, right? Because this is not the direction the Spirit would lead me. All right, so as, you, as we begin with the, in verse 19, it starts with, with adultery, right, which I have is a sexual act committed by a married person with someone other than their spouse, right? Next is fornication, which, you know, the typical definition of fornication is, is unmarried people having sex, right? And it does, I mean, you know, that is a, an accurate description, right? However, the word fornication actually is even broader than that. You know, we, we sometimes think this, adultery is, the, is worse than fornication, right? but fornication is actually the broader term. It actually includes adultery, right? It includes adultery, and it includes sex before marriage, right? But it encompasses all forms of sexual immorality, right? So it also picks up things like homosexuality, prostitution, bestiality, you know, sex with animals, child molesting, right? This is all part of the broader term of fornication, at least as it was used back then. Right? So, lest you think that they were just picking on sex before marriage, which, you know, is included, right? Any, any wrong sex acts are picked up here. So, even if they're not specifically listed, you know, some people might look and say, hey, wait, where's the say I can't have sex with animals, right? Well, the, the term fornication picks up all of that, okay? Uh, uncleanness is really defined as moral impurity, general unchastity, etc., Lasciviousness, anything that leads to uncleanness, such as filthy gestures, words, and, and so forth. Maybe sometimes the way you, the, you dress provocatively, or right, that kind of thing, can come under this, uh, this category. Uh, idolatry, worshiping of other gods or graven images. Okay? To me, from a more general perspective, it includes anything that you place higher than God. Because God needs to be above all, all right, which is what the, both the Ten Commandments and the commandments of Jesus teach us. God needs to be above all. So anything you place above God, see that I would refer to as idolatry because you're necessarily worshiping something else other than God. Because if God's at the top, then he gets your, your worship. So something that's higher than God is, uh, is getting your, your worship instead. So that I would term that as idolatry also. Of course, back at the time, this was being written, there were people, I mean, really had problems with the, you know, the, the idols that they worshipped and you know, the, the, the statues and, and so forth. There, and, Today, I don't know that there's as much of that. There's some, but to me, today, our own activities, our own focus would more be uh, described in terms of being like our idols and something to be, uh, to, to stay away from, that we would focus, number one, on, on God. Witchcraft, all right, to, to, can be uh, any uh, attempts, whether real or imagined, to converse or interact with spirits other than God. Right? So, for examples, would be things like uh, Ouija boards, seances, psychic episodes, and so forth. Right? This is all in, in the general category of, of, of witchcraft. Now, this is not to say, you know, when I said real or imagined, right, that, yeah, I mean, a lot of these things are, are just, uh, you know, fake to, to either make money or to impress me in some way. Like, you know, to, it's usually believed that, like, like, psychics, you know, just know how to ask you questions to find out stuff about you, and then they make like they somehow how knew it, right? So yeah, there's a lot of fakery going on. But the, there, are, there are evil spirits, right? So fooling around with these kind of things, I mean, you may actually have things happening in the spiritual realm, but it's not the good spiritual realm, it's the evil spiritual realm. So you, you really don't want to be conversing or interacting with the evil spirits, 
So that's why it's best to just stay away from this completely, the witchcraft area, because you're uh, treading into areas that are very, uh, you know, scary and a place where you just shouldn't be, which is messing around with the, with the evil spirits. Uh, hatred, extreme dislike for a person, which can include wishing or even contributing to evil against them. Uh, variance. Now, the, the variance in this context is a uh, difference that produces dispute, controversy, discord, discord, or dissension. All right. So, you know, someone who is a, a, a variance type person just means like you know they're a, a difficult person. They, they they bring about dissension and discord and so forth. Right? They're a disagreeable kind of person. I guess would be another way of uh, doing it. You know, you're, some, you're a troublemaker. Right? Someone who stirs up trouble between all, other people. Uh, emulations right? would, would be one that I wouldn't have guessed what it meant. Um, so someone involved with emulations is someone who attempts to be better than others at things in a way that leads to pride, jealousy, and unhealthy competitiveness. Right? Now, it can be a can be a, a, a good thing if you confine it to just being the best you know, that you can be. I mean, there's nothing wrong with trying to be the best you can be. But when it reaches the point of, well, I, I want to be better than this one and better than that one and be the best and be recognized and so forth, well, then it, to me, it's an unhealthy thing, right? So that's your emulation. Somebody who's always wanting to be better than everybody else and be recognized as better than everybody else is definitely a pride thing which causes jealousy, envy, and so forth. Uh, wrath would be anger to the point of desiring to take action against, against someone. So it's just even more than being just angry. It's angry to the point where you really want to, want to hurt somebody. You want to really or strike back at somebody. That's, uh, that's your wrath. Uh, strife is, is angry contention, quarrel, war, etc. Right? So an, an angry sort of a, of a contentious uh, situation. Seditions, r riots or violent demonstrations in opposition to the law or the administration of justice. And you know, at the time that, that we're studying this, I mean, we see that actually happening around our country, right? We see lots of, of, of riots and violent demonstrations, right, in opposition to the law of, of the land. So, you know, as, even as we're watching that, you see that that would be termed sedition in this case, right, where you're kind of taking the law into your own hands and being willing to be violent against the actual the government and the law and so forth, right? That would be termed as seditions. Heresies, principles or beliefs somewhat, re somewhat related to the doctrine of Christ that are in fact of man's own invention and not consistent with the gospel of Christ and the, the word of God. Right? So heresies, as I just said, you know, it, it's things maybe involved with the church or involved with the gospel where you just change a little bit. Right? Just, you know, maybe it's, it's almost what it was supposed to be, but you know, I'm changing it just some, maybe based on my own you know, my own thoughts and my own feeling, and you may think you're doing it for a good reason, but yet you're changing what the Lord originally taught, right? And an example of that, right, that I could use is, let's say the way baptism was originally done at the time of Christ, right? Christ was baptized in a certain way, baptisms were done in a certain way, and then as time passed, they were changed, right? And changed dramatically to the point where some today Say baptism is either not necessary, or you just put a couple of drops of water on somebody's head, and, and that, that's a baptism, right? That to me would be a heresy because if we're in the scripture, do you see that a couple of drops of water on the head and baptized, right? So changing the things of God, the, those are the heresies, and we believe in the Church of Jesus Christ, and there were many heresies committed in the early church to the point where there was what we refer to as an apostasy, right? That, that God's authority actually departed for a time and was restored in the early 1800s. Endings, extreme jealousy resulting in bad feelings towards those who have what we would like to have, right? So it's, a, it's, a, it's an extreme jealousy. Murder is the unlawful taking of another person's life. Drunkenness, when someone is intoxicated due to excessive drinking of alcoholic beverages, right? But the, you know, the, the key part of this, and you know, there's plenty of people who think there's nothing wrong with that, of course, right? But the people in this condition often commit the other works of the flesh that we've been just going through, right? A lot of the things you get in, into, sexual affairs, lasciviousness, uh, you know, being uh, difficult or unagreeable, disagreeable with others, a lot of it, drunkenness causes a lot of that, right? People who are drunk become very, you know, you, you can't reason with them, so they become illogical, they become disagreeable, they, they could do things they wouldn't normally do, Right? So that's, that's the real danger of, of drunkenness. It's not even so much the, the act itself as much as what it then causes you to do 
which is other things of, of the flesh, of the non-spirit, of the other fruits of the non-spirit that we're talking about. So that, that's what drunkenness can do, do to you. And then finally, revelings. Uh, another word for that might be what they call today partying. See, now, when I was young, all right, going to a party was, you know, was just a nice, nice thing, a nice get-together of people, all right? But today, partying is something totally different, all right? It usually includes things like drunkenness, lascivious behavior, and so forth. That's, that's partying. You go out and get drunk and get crazy, right? Well, clearly, as servants of God, that would not be something we, the Spirit would, would lead us to, right? So as you consider all of these things, right, these are, as I said, what I would call fruits of the non-Spirit, Fruits of the flesh, if you will. All right. So following the flesh, these are the kind of things that you get involved in. Again, it's not to say that every one of these is, uh, you know, is, is illegal, all right, or uh, you know, or some even wouldn't necessarily consider it wrong. But it's not a place where the spirit of God would lead you. Right? These are not things that you would be involved with as uh, a, a servant of Christ. Now, if you see the last part of this, where it says, "They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God." Now, I want to comment on that for a moment that, you know, certainly in reading that, it would sound like, you know, if you do these things, you're like out, you're disqualified, right? Now, first of all, I mean, anything can be forgiven, right? Although there is scripture that says murders are a tough one to be forgiven of, but nonetheless, anything can be forgiven, right? So if you repent of any of these acts, you can be forgiven and you can enter the kingdom of God, right? But more, it's, I think, the point that it's making is that, Remembering again, these are the fruits of, of the flesh and of not following the Spirit. Well, if you're not following the Spirit, how are you going to find your way to the kingdom of God? All right? It's not like you can just stumble into it unawares. The Spirit has to lead you there. The Spirit leads you to the kingdom of God. The Spirit leads you down a path that will allow you to inherit the, that eternal kingdom when you depart from, from this earth. So if you're not following the Spirit, you're not going to find your way there. And that's really I think, the point I'm trying to make here is that if you find yourself doing these things, it means you're following the flesh instead of the spirit, and then that's, you're not going to be led to the kingdom of God, which is really where you want to be if, you're, if you're, you've been converted and you have the spirit within you. That's where you want to be led, the spirit to lead the kingdom of God. The works of the flesh will not lead you there. The spirit of God will. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such... There is no law. Now, these two verses are the ones used most from the from Galatians. All right, that if you've ever heard people quote from Galatians, this is probably the, these two verses, and because it's what's known as the fruits of the spirit. All right, this, um, you know, if you grew up coming to church, coming to Sunday school, you probably had some Sunday school classes about it. Maybe your Sunday school room had the fruits of the spirit up on the wall. All right, that this is a popular uh, two verses here. Right? And now there are, are nine things listed here as fruits of the Spirit. And as I pointed out in the other verses, whereas those were fruits of the non-spirit or fruits of following the flesh, these are the good ones here. They, these are the ones you follow the Spirit, and, and these are the fruits you just see coming from your life. Again, not something to be, well, a checklist, all right? You know, got it, got it, got it, don't got it, right? But rather, you should see these things happening, right? It's not, it's not like it's law. But if you're following the Spirit, living by the Spirit, these are things that should be part of, of your life. Right? So again, we'll, I'll, I'll go through these briefly. Right? It says that the fruit of the Spirit is, is, is love. Right? Now the kind of love we're talking about is not, it's not a romantic love, but it's a love for mankind. It's a love that's it's a decision that you make that I'm going to love mankind in spite of, of, of what they may do, in spite of who they are, and even in spite of how they treat me. Right? That, that I would seek to show love to everybody, to, to love mankind, love your neighbor as yourself. Right? This, this would be the number one fruit of, of the Spirit. Okay, joy it would be joy in our life is, is not just a, a plain happiness. Right? Maybe people who are happy in life, happy because of what they've accomplished or, or who they're married to or how much money they have or, or the kind of home they live in or the kind of vacations they go on or whatever. Right, that, that's, you know, that's all good things and happy things, right? but that's not the kind of joy we're talking about. The kind of joy we're talking about is something that's with you every day of your life when you give your life to the Lord. Right? It's not dependent upon your circumstances. It's not dependent upon uh, you know, how, how much money you're making. It's not dependent upon whether things are going your way or not on that particular day. Right? The, the, the joy, it's the joy of salvation. It's the joy of knowing you were living in sin, 
you were on the path to eternal destruction and Christ snatched you from that path and put you in a different way of life, put you in the family of God. This is joy, right? That joy never goes away because you're always in the family of God. Regardless of your earthly circumstances, you're always part of the family of God. You're always on the path that leads to salvation. You always have that to look forward to. You always know that God is, is with you, that the Lord walks beside you day by day, and that the Lord loves you, and that never changes. So it, it's not dependent upon our circumstances in life. That's the kind of joy we're talking about. So that, that kind of joy should accompany you uh, every, day, uh, every day of your life. Now, peace would, would be, you know, what, what's peace, all right? It's not just the being quiet, okay? Being at peace, all right, means that you're, you're comfortable and confident that, that, that you're where you need to be with the Lord, okay? And it's, it's something that, you know, it, to me is very valuable because there's many situations in life that, uh, that bring turmoil, right, that bring stress. And in fact, the time we're living in right now, there's lots of stress and turmoil, right? So having peace, another part of it refers with the peace that passes understanding, right, is... Knowing that God's in the matter. So if you know that God's in the matter, then, then what, why worry? Right? Why, why have turmoil? Why be stressed? Right? Because you know that the Lord is in the matter. So having the peace within us, right, again, means we're following the Spirit. We're following the Spirit that we're exactly where God wants us to be. And then we can have peace in knowing that we're on the path and that God is with us. And if God's with us, who can be against us? And, and that means having, having peace. Next one is uh, long suffering, right? And uh, the the word itself would uh, give you a hint to, to what it means. It's not a word we would typically use today, right? But, but like patience might be another word that you might consider. But but yet, yeah, like like long suffering, you know, means that you're you're showing patience, that you're going through maybe things that would be difficult, all right? But yet you're waiting upon the Lord. You're waiting upon the Lord. So even when things are not going maybe as you would like them to in life yet you're willing to withstand it because, again, you know that you're where God wants you to be. So that you're, you have that patience in knowing that God's going to work it out in whatever way. It right? doesn't necessarily mean every bad situation turns into a good one. And obviously, it doesn't mean we get everything we want. You know, it's not saying, you know, like the saying all, all good things come to those who wait. Right? I mean, it doesn't matter or it doesn't mean that just because you wait, it's something good's going to happen. But you're waiting upon the Lord to let it be worked out in whatever way He would work it out. And so that's your long suffering, being willing to withstand the things of life, waiting upon the Lord to work it out in whatever way he would see fit. Uh, gentleness, right? That, uh, you know, you think of what it means to, to be gentle, right? It's the, uh, the opposite of being like harsh or, or unkind or, or so forth. And this would be a way we would treat other people, right? That, you know, we would never want people to think of us as unkind, right? Or cruel or mean. Right? But rather, we would treat people with, with gentleness, with, with love and concern and caring and so forth. That, you know, even, even if you were going to have to tell somebody they're doing something wrong, you can still do it in a gentle manner. Right? And showing that you're uh, sharing this with them because of your love and concern for them, not because you somehow enjoy banging them over the head right? or, or telling them that they were wrong. So that's the, the gentleness. Is, again, it's just kind of a nice gentle spirit that should accompany us as a, uh, as a servant of Christ. Goodness, I mean, you know, it can be a very general term. I mean, be good, okay? Well, you know, goodness would be, again, to me, trying to do the, the best that, that you can at, at the things of God, all right? That's, so that's just that idea. You, you want to do it right, right? You, you want to do things right. That would be, to me, goodness. Do, do it good. Do it right. Do it the best, the best that you can. Uh, faith is, is, I mean, your general definition of faith is, of course, believing in things not seen, right? But... Uh, being faithful to the Lord, right, it means, you know, you're willing to, to stick it out. You're willing, you know, which can also be called long-suffering. I mean, you're willing to depend upon the Lord, even when you don't see things working out the way you, you think they should, right? Yet you believe in God enough to say God's in the matter. God's got this, right? That's, that's having faith as opposed to, you know, when something goes wrong, you're immediately ready to throw up your hands. Okay, you know, you know. You know, God doesn't exist. God doesn't care. When I'm on my own, right? Well, that's that's the opposite of that, right? Living with faith means that we're trusting that God is in the matter and that He's going to work things out the way He would want them to be worked out. Meekness is uh, uh, 
you know, so someone who, who's meek, another word for that is to be humble, really. Okay, I mean, meekness in general, right, if, if you don't want to associate with the scripture, somebody who's meek is usually somebody who's like, like timid and, you know, like, like, a, like a little mouse kind of thing, right, and, uh, you know, never puts up, puts up a fight or an argument. To me, that's not what scripture means by meekness, all right? Meekness means being that way between you and God, all right, that you're humble before God, all right, and, and, uh, and also, you know, you can still uh, convey a humble spirit to other people, without necessarily being seen as, as weak or timid or so forth. Right? In fact, one saying that I heard is, is meekness is not weakness. Right? You don't have to be seen as weak and timid and giving in on everything. The idea is that you're humble, but still, you, when the time comes to stand up for what's right, stand up for the things of God, that, that, that's there as well. Right? You want to stand on the things of God, but it's not necessarily you have to have your way all the time. So in every single thing in life, but you just stand up for the things of God, and other things you're humble and pliable and treating people in a way that's not doesn't come off as proud and uh, you know that, that I I know it all and, I, and it's got to be my way and so forth. All right, that to me would be more the opposite of, of being meek. So being meek is uh, again just being humble, able to get along with people, but just standing up for things of God when when the time is right to do so. And finally, uh, temperance. Uh, another word for temperance is, uh, is self-control. All right, so you know, being being able to again control our own actions, control uh, you know what we do, what we say. See, I, I myself, you know, I, I generally, how shall I put it, think less of somebody who, who can't control themselves. All right, that uh, you know people will say things. Oh, I, I just have to say that. All right, even though it's totally inappropriate or totally offensive, but I had to say it. All right, well, have some self-control. All right, you know what I mean. To say what's right, hold back things that are not right, right? And then the same things with our, with our actions, right? Our actions, you know, I, you know, I couldn't help myself. I had, to, I, had to, you know, I had to go hit that person, or I had to go get drunk, or I had to do whatever. Have some self-control, all right? The Spirit of God is within you, so the Spirit of God is telling you what to do and what not to do, so and now have self-control and say that I'm going to do only the things that the Lord is prompting me to do. All right, so these are all things that are Consider the fruits of, of the Spirit, right? And then there's nine of them listed there. And at the end of verse 23, it says, Against such there is no law. See, so feel free to do them, right? And feel free to do as much of them as you want, right? There's no law that says, you know, you're, you're giving too much love, or you're, you know, you're giving too much kindness, or whatever. There's no law against that. So these are the fruits of the Spirit. Use them as much as possible. Uh, let, let them be seen as much as possible coming from your life that this way you would know that you're following the Spirit and not the flesh. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Okay, and as we finish up this chapter, okay, verse 24, it says, you know, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Okay, what does that mean to crucify the, the flesh? Well, to me, it's, it's the same thing as we talk about uh, killing the old man, right? That uh, other scripture talks about, you know, you, the old man is kind of laid to rest and is killed and you come out as a new creature in Christ. Well, that that's, to me would be what this is. Like, let's crucify or kill the, the fleshly desires. Lay the old man to rest, right? Don't, don't go back and, and pick him up again, but rather continue on now following the spirit instead of being tempted by the things of, of the flesh. So in other words, kill it off. You know, if you can think that way, say whatever person I was, whoever I was that had a desire for those things, consider that person is dead and gone, and now you're a new, a new creature in Christ. Now in 25, another way of saying the same thing is, is 25 says, if we live in the Spirit, let's also walk in the Spirit. That uh, you know, in more contemporary times, the the, the phrase is, uh, don't only talk the talk, but also walk the walk. In other words, it's, it's one thing to say how you should live or how a Christian should live or how, you know, a servant of God should live, right? But let's also walk the walk. Let's also do it, right? Don't just talk about it, but do it. And so that's why here in 25 it says, if we live in the Spirit, or I was wondering, if we say we live in the Spirit, then let us also walk in the Spirit, right? Let, let a, our, our Christian walk be such that it displays who we are as a, a servant of the Lord. So let's see the fruits of the Spirit coming from us and not the fruits of the flesh.
And finally, in, in 26, just as a last point, it says, uh, you know, it's not, about, it's not about pride. It's not about being seen as better than others. That's why it says, let's not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. This is more the, the fruit of the flesh, right? So, again, one, one more time, as we live in the Spirit, let's walk in the Spirit, seeing the fruits of the Spirit. Let's not walk in the flesh, seeing the fruits of the flesh, because that's going to lead us away from the kingdom of God.